So today we have the pleasure of having Jer Jerry Mitrovica from Harvard University who's going to give the keynote address that, that he wasn't able to do this morning. But Jerry, I want to thank you for still making the effort to come. I, I understand that um, you have other concerns to take care of, so I really want to thank you for still flying in today and all of that. Um, I am going to take the time to read um, Jerry's um, bio because I think it's pretty impressive. He has a lot of awards, so some of them I don't know too much about myself, but it's good to know that he has them and that he's very, that he's very, <laughs> that he's very knowledgeable about this topic. My point is that, you know, <laughs> he's well equipped to give this kind of like foundational talk and, and I'm really looking forward to learning from him. So, as I said, he's a professor of geophysics at Harvard, and he's also the director of the Earth Systems Evolution Program of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. His work focuses on sea level changes over time scales, ranging from the last decade to the age of the Earth. He's the recipient of the Rutherford Memorial Medal from the Royal Society of Canada, so Canada, check Canada, the Stacey Prize from the National Research Council, check America, the Augustus Love Medal from the European Geosciences Union, check Europe. He is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and in 2007 was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. He's the former J. Tuza Wilson Professor at the U University of Toronto and was a visiting Miller Professor at the University of California, Berkeley. Where haven't you been, Jerry? <laughs> so um, pretty impressive background, and I'm looking forward to hearing your talk. Hand over to you now. Thanks. I was just talking to Jeff Donnelly, and I certainly haven't been to as many exotic places as he has. My work is all on this laptop. so. Okay, is that, is that better or? Okay. All right, so this isn't going to be a good news story in any way. Uh, so I thought I would start with an anecdote. The third or fourth last time I was on the Cape, I was asked to be a judge in a science fair. And I said, no, 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 no. And then the guilt started getting to me, and so I said, okay, I'll do it. And it was somewhere near the Bourne Bridge. Uh, I uh, was one of 10 judges. Um, the kids I took care of, it's just the, the most amazing thing about these science fairs is it's impossible for these kids to have done this stuff themselves. <laughs> their mother or their father was a PhD in engineering or something. <laughs> the woman who won, or the girl who won, this is all very young, was um, measured the viscosity of cow's blood. And I never really quite understood why we needed to know that. But <laughs> my favorite was this young kid named Joey who had built a sundial. And it, I, he was my favorite because he obviously built it himself. Because it was terrible. He had, <laughs> he'd cut it out of a cardboard thing. It was all cardboard. It had the little thing that casts the shadow. And I asked him a bunch of questions, really liked him, ranked him first, brought him to the main event. And at the main event, I said, OK, Joey, tell us a little bit about the sundial. And he explained a little. I said, well, can you use this sundial 24 hours a day? And he said, yeah. I said, really? Day and night, Joey, day and night? He goes, no, you can't use it at night. Sorry, it's a sundial. I said, good. What about every day? He said, yes. I said, even on a cloudy, cloudy day? And he said, yeah, of course. And I said, if it's raining, Joey, can you use this sundial it's raining? <laughs> He's, uh, marks were plummeting at this stage. And so I asked him about the rain, and he looks at me like I'm the moron, and he says, no, it's made out of cardboard. The rain will ruin it. <laughs> so he's my kind of graduate student, thinks outside the box. So with a little bit of laughter, we get to things that aren't so funny. Um, I'm going to give you a very general discussion of what we know and don't know about sea level a little bit, some of the uncertainties. Jeff and I were just talking. In some sense, modern sea level is out of the realm of my research now because I think it's now in the realm of people who look at sea levels from satellites, et cetera, take data, because the models and our knowledge of them have reached maturity. So just like Jeff, uh, I now spend most of my time looking at paleo sea levels, sea levels throughout the Ice Age. So it's fun to turn my attention back to some modern sea level work here. Very background, Tona Marie who dealt with the stressful morning, wondering if I was going to show up, 
um, asked me to give a general overview. I hope you don't mind. Most of you know this, but I think it's important that we at least review. The greenhouse effect, of course, we all know about that. Sunlight passes through the Earth's atmosphere. It warms up both the land and the ocean. People don't quite realize that. This warmed up area of the Earth's surface then emits infrared radiation, which is captured to some extent by this blanket, by these greenhouse gases. Most of it, of course, escapes back to outer space, but this capture leads to a warming. And we're lucky it does, because if we didn't have some of these greenhouse gases, the surface temperature of the Earth would be 35 degrees Celsius colder. You know, this is, in a sense, a natural greenhouse. is an important thing for the evolution of the human species. Unfortunately, now we're getting into an enhanced greenhouse effect because of a variety of different greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and even water vapor. You know, I deal, and I'll deal later in this talk, with a lot of uh, um, arguments that are posed by climate change skeptics, most of which are you can easily dismiss. Uh, this is one that you, uh, the skepticism associated with this, this plot is easy to dismiss. We never ha we've never had, throughout this ice age, last million years, more than 300 parts per million of CO2 concentration until this century. We're now at 400, and we're either going to get as high as six or 900, depending on the scenario that you believe. It's likely to be somewhere in that. My guess, I don't do this kind of work, is it certainly closer to the upper bound. That's the problem. There are lots of consequences. Sea level, which is the main topic of this talk, is going to be the primary one I'll talk about. But the other one, of course, is temperatures, which, of course, link to sea level. It's sort of really a sobering uh, uh, thing to realize that all but one of the 20 hottest days ever recorded occurred in the last 25 years. And I think you'll agree that this one is probably also going to be one of the hottest on record. There's almost no doubt about it. As I said, we now have memories that extend far enough that weather is becoming climate. When I moved to Canada in the early 70s from, the, uh, from Australia, um, ice would cover the streets throughout. And you used to have these picks to pick through the ice. The fact is you never have to do that anymore in Toronto. And that trend is part of this trend. OK, we've all seen pictures like this. This is perhaps the most famous picture of Grinnell Glacier. This is just south of the Canadian border. I seem to bring everything back to Canada for some reason. Um, the picture here about 70 years ago and here about five years ago, there are pictures like this everywhere. You just have to Google glace, mountain glaciers and you see them. This is one that's often used in these talks for a good reason. This glacier was considered to be stable even as uh, recent as 20 years ago. Of course, we have a catalog all through the Earth of mountain glaciers, what they've been doing since 1970. Almost all of them, with few exceptions, for example, in Finiscandia, show rapid melting events. I studied the Alaskan glacier system, for example, and that is certainly going through a process of accelerated melting and sea level rise that's associated with that. As I tell my uh, students, or anybody who's interested in Ernest Hemingway, if you want to see the snows of Kilimanjaro, you better go there in the next 10 years. Otherwise, you'll be out of luck. Sea ice is an important factor for those who know about climate models. Sea ice is one of these really important inputs into climate systems because sea ice reflects. It has an albedo that reflects sunlight. And it, it, it's an important uh, uh, mechanism within the climate system. But the fact is that at least in the North Pole region, sea ice extent has diminished considerably. We've all heard in the last few years in particular, you hear a lot of news reports about sea ice not reaching sort of record minimal uh, extent. And it's certainly probably true that sometime in the uh, century, we'll actually have an entire winter when there will be no ice over the Arctic. We're nearly there now, of course, right? After all, we're past this 2007 point, look where we were just 35 years ago. This has important implications. I'll talk uh, later uh, in this presentation on the Antarctic ice sheet. I spent a lot of time considering that ice sheet. What people used to uh, bet on in some ways in the Antarctic is, yes, we sort of knew the coastal regions of the Antarctic were warming, and that was bad news. So ice would be melting from these shelves, etc. But people thought that the interior of ice sheets, the interior of the Antarctic ice sheet, would be cooling and would be growing ice, and there might be a net balance. But that isn't true. 
We know that's not true. An important paper published just a couple of years ago showed that the entire Antarctic ice sheet is now warming. The West Antarctic more than the East, and that's problematic for a variety of reasons I'll get to later. And there's plenty of evidence for this. You know, no longer have to draw cartoons in this field anymore predicting what will happen. You actually have lots of satellite imagery that's scary enough. Why is it that the Antarctic is such a concern, and the West Antarctic? This is the one you hear about most in the news, and the reason is that it's fringed by these large ice shelves here and here. And ice shelves act as a girdle on ice sheets. They hold the main ice sheet back. By friction, they're kind of connected to solid rock on their sides, and so they just hold everything back behind them. They stabilize an ice sheet. If those ice sheets collapse, then the, uh, if, sorry, ice shelves collapse, then the ice sheet behind them has nothing stopping it from then just pushing out into the ocean, breaking up into iceberg armadas, and uh, with the consequent sea level rise. Why are ice shelves so prone to collapse? Why is sea level such an, uh, a pressing societal issue? The reason is, if you warm climate, you hit ice shelves in two ways. You warm the ocean. This was something that wasn't understood even just a few years ago. And of course, you warm the air. So these ice shelves are warmed both from below and from above. And they're thinning in both directions. And they're collapsing. And there's good examples of that. This is the Larsen ice shelf. This this didn't really catch people si by surprise in the climate community. People understood that this ice shelf there, or part of this part of the major peninsula ice shelf, seemed to be going unstable. And in fact, it did about 10 years ago now. We're right in a period. So this is almost the 10th anniversary of this stuff. You see, from the end of January right through March, a collapse of the ice shelf. That happened. So. Uh, Enough ice, about the size of Rhode Island, as I've written down there, which I uh, Googled just before uh, preparing this, disappeared in three weeks okay? and went out into the ocean. Some of it rafted up towards Australia, in fact. Okay? The Wilkins Ice Shelf, this was a total surprise. Nobody expected this to happen until it did, and it disappeared in about two days. So what happened here was the ice shelf just started collapsing and continued collapsing here to the south. The blue you're seeing here isn't the water. You're actually just seeing into the deepest part of the ice shelf. And this all collapsed. This is over a one, one and a half week period, but most of the collapse took place in 48 hours. Nobody had predicted the collapse of that ice shelf. Lots of people predicting collapse of ice shelves in this area. This is the Pine Island Glacier. This is ground zero now in West Antarctic research because we now know that this glacier is melting faster than any glacier in the Antarctic region. We know it from gravity records. I want to show you an example of this. This is why I said that to some extent this field is moving beyond people like me. I theoretically model how sea levels should change and what you should be looking for. The real power in this research is coming from things like satellite observations. Satellite observations of the Antarctic show a whopping um, mass flux or melting of the Antarctic ice sheet in this Pine Island glacier. So this, as I said, is ground zero. Same is true over Greenland. That same gravity survey whizzes around the Earth and also looks at gravity changes over Greenland. And what you notice here in the color scheme is the southern sector of the Greenland ice sheet, its melting is definitely accelerating. There is some increase in mass in the middle of the ice sheet right at its very center. But that's only about one-tenth of the decrease at the southern margin. So in balance, the Greenland ice sheet is also melting now. And there's very little we can do to stop it anymore. Okay? These are the sort of things I show to classes or general public lectures. Uh, New England's done a very good job, actually, at providing these scenarios for a variety of things. We've seen some talks this morning. I've missed most of them. But I'm sure you heard this type of, uh, of argument. What will happen? Sea level is just one symptom of the climate change, right? There are many, right? This is something that I pulled off the web. The link is down here. You can see when you download the talk on, off the web. This just shows you that in 1990, for example, Massachusetts had the climate uh, in, of New Hampshire. But as we move forward in the century, the climate of Massachusetts will move to the climate of what we're currently experiencing in the southern US states. So imagine that. Hard to believe, right? I have, I'm a Canadian, so all the snowbirds used to come all the way down here. They can stop in Massachusetts. 
now and revive our economy as sea level swamps our coast, right? Okay, this is sobering. In Boston, Massachusetts, by the end of this century, depending on whether you take the minimum scenario or the maximum scenario, we'll suddenly have on the order of one to two dozen days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, right? On average, every year. Um, flooding, uh, let me get my, set. this is, I guess, Faneuil Hall, I think, somewhere here. But this hatched region here represents the flood zone uh, as we expect it today, the 100-year flood zone. But going forward in time, the flood zone is going to encroach on a large part of the waterfront of Boston. This is not my expertise. Let me, though, move to my expertise, which was in sea level, is in sea level. 70% of the world's surface covered by oceans. I moved from a, uh, a seaside part of Melbourne to landlocked Toronto, back now to an ocean front. No, I can't afford an ocean front in this area, but I'm in, I'm in vicinity of an I take the T to the ocean front, right? <laughs> what do we know about sea level change in the last 100 years? What we know is that on average, sea level rise over the last century was about two and a half millimeters per year. That's an inch every 10 years. So in the last century, we went up about a foot in sea level. And you already know that coastal slopes are very gradual. A foot does a lot of damage, but it's going to get worse. Okay. When I give talks, uh, um, and I'm happy to take questions like this here today, I'm often confronted by uh, skeptics, people who get up who have their own theories of this. And there are three variations to what they ask me. First is, yeah, yeah, we accept that sea level rise is going on, but it's nothing special. It's been going on for thousands of years. That's something you've probably heard a number of times. The second is, it won't get worse. Yes, we know, it's two and a half millimeters per year, it's not going to get worse. And the third, a far more subtle question is, but wait a minute, it varies from place to place. Sea level change in Boston is very different from Melbourne, is very different from South America, et cetera. How can this be? If ice sheets are melting, sea level should be going up more or less uniformly. Okay, so I'm gonna try to answer these questions. If you ever face these skeptics, you can scoff and use my answers, okay? <laughs> It's nothing special. That's the first question. Yes, it is something special. We, Jeff and I were just talking about these high stands in sea level that are in the equatorial Pacific region. These sorts of features are pervasive throughout the equatorial Pacific. In this case, you're seeing a coral. The top of that coral is three meters above sea level. It's about 5,000 years of age. If sea level had been going up two and a half millimeters per year for the last 5,000 years, this coral would be under 10 meters of water. It's not. We understand full well why sea level fell in this region. We can explain this. This is, believe it or not, you're sunning yourself here on a beach somewhere. This is an effect that's associated with the Ice Age. I don't have time to go into it, but we can predict this very accurately. But the important point to note is that it would be under 10 meters of water if those skeptics were correct. This is one of my favorite papers in all of the sea level literature. Unfortunately, it's not mine, right? But it's a paper by a colleague, Kurt Lambeck, at the Australian National University. And what Kurt did to go back and answer that question is he recognized that, that very wealthy Romans built fish tanks, fish holding tanks, right? Fishermen would come in with the fish, you put them in the tank, when you're ready to eat them, you pull them out of the tank. And they're very accurately placed relative to high tide. You want water to refresh, but you don't want them to get out, obviously, right? And so after doing corrections again for the Ice Age, he concluded in the last 2,500 years since these were built, sea level had not changed at all. So again, it is anomalous. This 2.3 millimeters per year cannot have been going on for 2,000 years. These would be under five meters of water, okay? That's the easiest to dismiss. The next question is, well, it won't get worse. Unfortunately, it already has gotten worse, right? If you now use satellite systems, over the last 100 years, we didn't use satellite systems in general to measure how sea level had changed. We use these very low-tech but incredibly useful things we call tide gauges, right? C cylinders with a ping-pong ball in them basically going up and down. It's incredible what a device like that has told us about sea level. 90% of my modern sea level work is not using satellite. It's still using these old tide gauge records. They're the most important because they're the longest record. But nonetheless, in the last 10 years or so, we can use satellites to determine sea level. And when we do that, 
because satellites just range down to the surface. It sends a signal, gets it the uh, return signal, and determines how, where the sea height is, and repeats that calculation over and over again, and measures how that height is changing. And when you do that, you notice that in the last 15 years, sea level hasn't been rising on average two millimeters per year, as we said it was in the 20th century. It's now up to three to four millimeters per year. We're already well above where we were in the average of the 20th century rate. That's a problem. The IPCC report that many of you know, this Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, I don't participate in that report consciously. I like to stay independent of such reports. This is the projection that that report made for the 20th century in the yellow here. Most of us in sea level research were dumbfounded by this because we knew that the upper bound on this uh, projection had already been exceeded. So I really don't know where this is coming from to some extent. But what I can tell you is that 3 millimeters per year, 3.4 millimeters per year that satellite signals have measured is already at the upper bound of the projection and we've just started. So there's no doubt in most people who study sea level mine that by the end of the century, we won't be down to this level. We'll be up to about a meter of additional sea level rise in the next 100 years. I shouldn't say there's no doubt about that, but there's good evidence to support that type of projection. Now let me give you probably even Joey would have loved this, right? Um, uh, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to teach you a little bit about the subtle physics of sea level change because this subtle physics is important to keep in mind when you're making policy decisions. Because sea level does not change uniformly everywhere around the globe. And the key will be to predict, knowing, giving, given our understanding of why that variation occurs, to predict that pa pattern of sea level change. The, the climate change skeptics who would say to you, well, wait a minute, I look at tide gauge records or satellite signals, and one place is going up, one place is going down, what's going on? They believe in this bathtub model, right? That's what we call it, literally. That you believe if an ice sheet melts, sea level is just going to go up uniformly. And now I'm going to show you something that is as counterintuitive as science could be, right? Famous physicist Richard Feynman said, we learn physics because our intuition fails us. This is where your intuition would fail you, right? It turns out that sea level falls near a melting ice sheet. Okay, why is that? An ice sheet, just like the sun and the moon, attracts water towards it. it. It provides a tide on that water. When the ice sheet melts, of course, you're dumping meltwater into the ocean. You're definitely increasing the mass in the ocean. But you're also relaxing this gravitational pull. And it turns out that close to the ice sheet, this is highly exaggerated, the middle of the ocean isn't exposed, uh, uh, close to the ice sheet, this relaxation of the tide wins when an ice sheet melts, right? What's close?